Good evening. I'm Jim Girak and welcome to the seventh edition of Chicago's War on Drugs. Today is May 16th, 2017. Each Tuesday for 13 weeks, we ask you and our guests the central question, which is worse, drugs or the war on drugs? Tonight, we might ask which is worse, guns, gangs, drugs, or the war on drugs? Uh, I, I think we could maybe drop a rock on all, all, all of them because they're all not so good. Um, but uh, tonight, uh, we're going to have a special guest, Mark Walsh, uh, who is with, uh, he's the campaign director for Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence, the largest state organization to uh, work for the prevention of violence. Uh, Mark, it's really nice to Very have you nice with to us. Be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, we, we have had um, just so much violence uh, so frequently. Uh, we've had a headline here, uh, the week started with 70, 17 people shot in Chicago over 15 hours. And then we just had a, a Mother's Day uh, where 21 people were shot over the weekend, uh, which, believe it or not, is a drop in violence from, from what it was uh, the year before. So uh, we uh, want to talk with our guest tonight uh, and ask uh, him, what, what do you think of this violence in Chicago and Illinois, uh, and, and um, what can we do about it? That's a great question, Jim, and thanks for having me on. Um, I, I really think, and I said this in a meeting I was in earlier today when um, at the American Heart Association, the violence in Chicago is really at an epidemic level. Um, you know, if, and I do the same thing, when you read the numbers for Mother's Day, you, the first, my first reaction was, oh, that wasn't a bad weekend. 24 people being shot is a problem. It's a crisis. Um, you know, it's more than just the guns and the bullets, unfortunately. It's, it's um, lack of economic opportunity. Uh, obviously, drugs plays a huge role in that. And what we really need to do is focus on not only short-term solutions to reduce the violence plague in our communities, but also long-term solutions to address the core issues. Mm -hmm. Well, but before it gets away from me, I should point out that uh, we're here thanks to Azteca Baseball League, which is a nonprofit organization that you can reach at the uh, website address shown uh, and at the phone number or drugnews1 at yahoo.com. Uh, but, but they're enabling us to come and discuss these issues that are of such great uh, concern to Chicagoans. Uh, you know, it seems uh, like so many people are so frustrated with the violence, they say, well, let's call in the National Guard. Mm -hmm. Let's increase the penalties for guns. Um, let's let's impose greater restrictions on guns, greater restrictions on drugs. Uh, let's uh, incarcerate more people, and that's basically what we've been doing since we started the war on drugs when Nixon declared it in 1971. Why, why has it not worked? Well, I think part of it is, and we've seen this with increased penalty um, laws, they don't deter crime. They don't deter that person from taking that step to grabbing that gun or selling those drugs. Mm -hmm. What we need to focus, I believe, on is a, a, a radical change in what we are doing. You know, if you're a repeat offender uh, with firearms, how'd you get there? If you're a repeat offender with drug crimes, how did you get there? We don't talk about that. We're just a very much, let's lock everybody up and our s streets are safe. We saw, I, um, and I often say I had a a uh, conversation with a former FBI agent who was part of the um, El Rukin investigation in the 80s and he said to me at the time I said we have either controlled the problem or we've caused a new one and I think if you look uh, through the lens of today clearly we caused a new one and what we have to do I believe is really address some of those fundamental issues you know if you look at a map of Chicago the violence m remains in several of the same communities. It's the west side and south side. There's been a few communities that have ch have reduced violence and most of that's through gentrification. So why is that? And why is that acceptable? You know, we close 50 schools and they're all on the south and west side. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, one year we had 300, or let's see, 30,000 people released from Illinois prison system in one year. Uh, the Illinois prison population, uh, for those of you who don't know, is, is basically 50,000 
uh, a year. And when you let 30,000 people out with convictions for felony marijuana, nonviolent crimes, uh, uh, selling heroin, e even if it wasn't a violent crime, you are a convicted felony, uh, felon and, and you, you apply for a job, well, nobody's going to hire you. So if you release 30,000 people into Chicago and its neighborhoods, what, what is the employer of last resort? In that situation, what are you going to? You're going to be on the street in an illegal trade of some sort. Sure, yeah. and and so often it's drugs because it, it's so easy. You can put such a small quantity of drugs in your pocket that it's hard for the police and others to detect. Uh, and the one qualification to go into the drug business in Chicago as a released uh, felon is you've got to have a gun, because it's, the drugs are so valuable. Somebody's going to try and take the drugs from you, or they're going to try and take your corner from you. Uh, and, and as a consequence, you've got to have a gun. But if you're a convicted felon, you're immediately in violation of the law if you have possession of a gun. So now the superintendent of police in Chicago goes down to Springfield and says, well, let's increase the penalties um, on, on guns. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, well, the war on drugs doesn't work, uh, so let's change drug laws. He says, let's increase the penalties. And as you pointed out, it doesn't work. Right. And actually, in the uh, original piece of legislation, not the one that eventually passed, um, there were a lot of what I thought were common sense provisions on just, just what you're saying, reducing some of the um, charges for, for drug dealing, um, a, as well as the weight that they were holding. One of the backlashes that happened was suburban legislators stood up and said, well, we can't do that because of the heroin epidemic mm -hmm. um, that's plaguing our community. And, and it, it is amazing rates um, that we see increasing through, you know, obviously the dependence on um, Oxycontin-related drugs. Mm -hmm. And what, what we're seeing, though, is why is it that we have to protect one group of citizens from drugs, in this case, and, and yet we're going to lock up the people that are selling them who are really as to your point, being forced into that <clears throat> because they don't have the job opportunities. You know, we need to protect in Chicago and Illinois all of our people, Absolutely. not certain segments, not just the, the west side or the south side or, 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 or the suburban collar counties. We need to protect all of the people throughout the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. And what's happening with this uh, overdose, you mentioned the suburban guys saying, well, we can't do this or that because of the, the opium epidemic. The opium epidemic is really a prohibition epidemic, mm -hmm. where when you prohibit something, you give up the right to control and regulate it. And drugs are too dangerous, in some cases, not to control and regulate. So you can't make them put a label on it. You can't license the place of business. You can't sell from a fixed place of business. You can't have government inspection of the product. You can't limit the amount of, of potency that the drug has. You can't make sure that it's not being cut with, with, cut with fentanyl or some, some, some other right. horrible substance to make it worse. So prohibition is really the enemy. That's what's so hard to get across to people. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it's hard to get across with elected officials. <laughs> right? Especially. I, I, I think it's difficult to get across with other individuals. But, you know, I, and I think we see the same thing with gun um, violence prevention legislation, everyone's so worried about being labeled soft on crime. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to throw the book at someone who, uh, you know, uh, we could help somewhere along the way before they get into the prison system. Um, and we really need, you know, and I rant about this all the time, the biggest problem we have in this state right now is we've gone 22 months without a state budget. So social services, um, any type of thing that would, would help change the path people are on isn't being funded. And we talk about a lot of the symptoms, but until there's that, that demand that we fund programs that work, we're going to continue to see this over and over. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. This is the first time I've done a, a show like this, and, and I've invited the governor. I've invited uh, candidates who are going to be running for governor and, and asked them, what, what is the relationship between Chicago violence and the war on drugs? Does the war on drugs make it worse instead of better? 
and and these these politicians and prospective politicians are are reluctant to, to discuss it. Now I see a, we have a caller. Let's let's take this call and caller is three one two three seven three eight ten sixty. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. How yes, you're you on the air. This evening. What is your question? Okay, I think we little. Okay, I got you now. I think we little need a lot more help from the mayor. Okay, I got you now. I think we need a lot more presence of police on the streets where the troubles are. Okay. And instead of having cameras, have real police on the corners. So, so you don't think the cameras are particularly helpful? I don't think so. I think it'd be a lot better presence of police officers. We need the good police officers back and the respect from the communities and let them do their jobs. What, what, what do you think we, we can do about the, the drugs uh, and, and the guns uh, and that the gangs? The gangbangers are going to have to do that between themselves. That is a long time war that will never, ever, ever end. It goes all the way back to Al Capone. Yeah, the, the, they are going to have to solve that themselves because it seems to me the violence is getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and there's more drugs coming in and in and in, yeah. and nobody can seem to stop it. That's going to have to come within themselves. All right. When they start seeing their family members dropping like flies because of drugs, they're going to have to control that. But All right, caller, th thank, thank you uh, f for your question. Uh, what comment do you have? You know, I, I think uh, she brought up a, a, a number of excellent points, but the one thing that caught me to what you were saying earlier is she took it right back to the prohibition um, and Al Capone. And what we've seen in states that have, uh, particularly uh, with marijuana, decriminalized it and legalized it is they don't seem to be having the crime issues that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one thing that we have to look at. Eh, if you look at a state like Colorado, it's also a, a, a funding source. Mm -hmm. So you're getting the, the money in that could be put into those programs. You're getting the money in that could hire more police on the street, job training and things like that. Um, and so to your, to your earlier question, it, it extends all the way back to the prohibition. I was looking for a graphic here on, on, on the computer because I have a picture of a, of a Tommy gun, uh, which is what, of course, Al Capone and his uh, gang members used back during the prohibition of alcohol, and they would be hanging off uh, Packers uh, and as they would shoot up uh, rival uh, drug distributors. And today, instead of the Tommy gun, we have the AK-47. Uh, so it's, it's the exact same thing, except they're using SUVs. The bullets are more potent. They fire more quickly. They do more damage. Uh, we keep we keep putting uh, band-aid on the solution. We say, well, we need more trauma centers. So uh, uh, we, we've got better uh, medical care to reduce the number of people killed. But we're still shooting 4,000 people in, in 2016 in Chicago alone. Um, we, we really have to revisit this idea of prohibition saving people from drugs or saving them from violence. Uh, it simply doesn't work. I was at a place uh, for Mother's Day and, uh, and, and uh, I, I said it was an honor to be there. Uh, a Townsend Music Ministries was, was holding this event. And um, I, I said, you know, our heart goes out to all of the mothers, the mothers who are losing kids because of, of the violence the, the mothers who are losing kids because of overdose and the mothers who are losing kids because we have a system that locks people up because they engage in consensual adult activity uh, where somebody wants to willingly buy or sell drugs, which are uncontrolled and unregulated because of our foolish Chicago's war on drugs. Absolutely. And, and it's an excellent point as well. I mean, it's, it's not just the mother who loses the child to an overdose or a child to gun violence. The, the loss of a child is something that not only impacts the family, but it impacts the community. Um, and it, it's, you know, I spent a lot of mothers, my Mother's Day talking to um, mothers who've buried their children because of gun violence. They can't bring that back, and it's a painful day, and it's a painful day for the entire community because of the way that you know, these laws are enacted. Mm -hmm. 
You know, um, people who are concerned about the violence, uh, they say, well, let's go after the guns. And we have Father Flager and other community leaders who lead marches against the, the, the guns and they have buyback programs. And, of course, those, those do some good. But there are an estimated, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, 300 million guns in private hands in yes. the United States. So the horse is basically largely out of the barn. Uh, and, and so if we try and figure out, well, can we take the guns away, or is it better to try and take the reason away that people are shooting one another? If, if you have a gun and I have a gun and we live uh, in the same suburban area uh, where, where there is no crime and I'm not in the drug business and you're not in the drug business and you're not an armed robber and I'm not, I mean, we're not in too much danger. Right. Uh, we might be burglarized uh, and somebody get into the house and get the gun and maybe we'll get shot with their own gun. I mean, that's a, that's a harm. But uh, if, you, if you take away the reason, and the reason that the kids are getting shot in Chicago is because the, the, the drug trade feeds the gangs and, mm -hmm. and, and drives the violence as they fight over who's going to control drug turf, which we make as citizens because for a long time the United States has supported a war on drugs, which is a failed policy. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a great point. And I think, you know, when I have conversations with, uh, obviously the council is a statewide organization, um, so I have conversations with people in Carbondale and Cairo or people in Rockford, um, and Rockford has similar problems to what Chicago has. But it's an approach, uh, you know, people in those rural type areas look at a gun as a tool. Mm -hmm. They're law-abiding gun owners. They know where their guns are. They keep their guns, you know, um, safely stored. That's not happening in Chicago because there's, you know, as I said at a meeting the other day, I've yet to see a deer on 95th Street. You know, we're not hunting animals here. We're mm -hmm. using them for, uh, to maintain, I've got to maintain respect or I've got to maintain my rep. And, and, and that's a very interesting question you ask. I think we have to do something to get the illegal guns off of our streets. You know, I, I, you mentioned Father Flagger and, and the gun buyback. The city of Chicago takes 10,000 guns off the street a year. Mm -hmm. They get replaced. If they were taking them sure. all off, we wouldn't have this problem. And to sure. your point, it's the, the kid who needs to protect himself in the corner. Sure. It, it's like the, the war on drugs spews out these crises of guns, gangs, crime, uh, drugs, overdose, AIDS, uh, uh, prison costs so you can't pay for schools. Um, and, and instead of somebody turning off the faucets, uh, the war on drugs that's pouring these, these crises out, well, we keep putting band-aids. Uh, we need tougher laws, more police, the National Guard. Uh, uh, we have two callers, uh, I see. Let's take one. Hello, caller. How you doing? Good. Uh, what we got to do is what we got to do is bring back, bring uh, back speak the draft. We have to bring back the draft and draft these kids back into the military. This way. To get them off the street. Who is it we're trying to get off the street? And that's the only way they're going to get educated through the military. Prison doesn't work anymore. What prison? Prison doesn't work. Okay, let's let's see what our guest has to say. You know, I I, I agree that the way that our correctional system is set up, it, it's not to rehabilitate; it's to incarcerate. Um, I'm not sure about a draft. Uh, I think there's other things we can do. You know, I look at some communities that are heavily impacted by all the things we're talking about, and maybe a, a WPA type program that would create jobs would be something to look at. You know, obviously that on this administration is probably not going to happen, but people would learn a trade, they would learn a skill, and they would help um, fix up communities that need to be. Uh, that need maintenance. The one trillion dollars we have spent on the lost war on drugs would be better spent on job opportunities and CC camps and the type of things that they did back during the 30s when there was a huge unemployment problem in the United States and why not do it again instead of increasing penalties and building more prisons like our Attorney General Sessions is talking about doing now. We have another caller. Yes, good evening. I can tell you exactly how you could solve this problem. You look at the success they had down in Maricopa County 
in Arizona under Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Now, this was the first time the man's like 80 years old and he lost his election with like only 46% of the vote. But for the past 20, 25 years or so, they took people in on, on gun charges and on drug charges and they made them work when they were in prison. They had outside camps for them. And, and, and when you put somebody in, when you incarcerate somebody, you, you make them really earn their time, you know, time. So when they get out, they've truly changed their ways. If they had the guts to do that here, you wouldn't have these issues. And that's why you can't have soft on drug or soft on crime policies. You guys aren't looking at this for, for a solution. You really All right. Caller, let's let our guest uh, respond. Uh, you know, I think the, the example of uh, Sheriff Joe is not necessarily the one that I would look to. Um, you know, I think, and I said, you know, we're not doing rehabilitative work in our prison system. Uh, people are locked up and, and they stay locked up. Uh, there's, and they come out sharper criminals. Um, I think what we need to do is, before we start lo locking people up, we need to look on the front end and say, how do we keep people from getting into the system? Okay. The largest farm, I, I believe this is correct, the largest farm in, in Illinois is, is run by the prison system. We often put people who are in prison to work, and what we do is we pay them peanuts, and, and, and other people gain and benefit from the labor of someone else. There's a woman who wrote a book, Michelle Alexander, uh, and, and the name of the book was The New Jim Crow. And the thesis for her book was the idea that, well, we can't discriminate against people because they're black or minorities or their religion and the other things that aren't permitted in the United States. But if we can convict them of a crime, we now have the right to put them in prison. We have the right to take away their right to vote. We can take away their right to Pell Grants, to federal grants, the right to an education, the right to federal benefits, the right to housing. The, the, the right to basically live, we take away their, their clean records so that they're, they're unemployable and then we return them to the community where they live, uh, which is the same circumstances of destitution and unemployment uh, that they came from and we expect things to change. Um, Einstein said uh, something about that and I can't recall the quote. <laughs> you can't do the same thing and expect a different result. Uh, you shoot your, your, yourself in the foot uh, and it hurts and you do it again and it hurts again. That's quit shooting yourself in the foot. And that's what we do with Chicago's war on drugs. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, we're kind of winding down here. We have a few minutes to go. But, uh, you know, the, one of the things that occurs to me about trying to control weapons, once we invent the club, you can't make the club go away. Once you invent the bow and arrow, now the bow and arrow doesn't go away. And eventually you, you invent these horribly powerful guns and, you know, it's difficult to make them go away, which gets me back to the point, if we take away the reason people are shooting one another. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would also say if you look at, and you talked about it with the photo of Al Capone and the Tommy gun, over time the lethality of weapons is the problem. This isn't Grandpa's Colt 45. This is an AK-47 or an AR-15. You know, we saw it last week in the hands of a 17-year-old shooting a police officer. Mm -hmm. How do you have access to that? There's no need. Those guns were designed for one thing, and it's not hunting. It's for killing people. Um, that's why they're weapons of war. And so I, I think while we address the system, uh, we also have to figure out a way to get these weapons of, of destruction off of our streets. Yeah. Well, I think there's a commonality with these uh, issues of guns and drugs. It's not the things that are, that are bad in themselves, it's what people are doing with them. If people abuse them, uh, you, can, you can take a, a, a hoe and make it into a weapon. You can take a toilet seat and turn it into a, a deadly weapon. Absolutely. Uh, so we, we as a society really uh, need to start better controlling uh, people f from the harms of guns and gun violence, and to do that, we need uh, drug policy reform, something other than this Al Capone prohibition system, uh, which has just caused so much damage. Um, I want to thank again uh, our guest, thank Mark, who came in. Uh, uh, it, it's really great to talk to you, and uh, we, we folks here at Chicago's War on Drugs look forward to you being back next week. Um, uh, to answer the question, which is worse, drugs or the war on drugs, 
I'm Jim Girag, and good night.